my name is Chris Andrews. I'm the 3D product manager at Esri. Uh, I started out about a little under four years ago as just me in a new role at Esri, and now I've got five product managers that work with me, and then uh, there, there are many more folks doing 3D at Esri. So we've seen a tremendous growth of 3D in ArcGIS. I am going to do a really quick kind of survey overview of what's going on. There's way more than I could cram into an hour here today, but if your heads are spinning afterwards, then, then, uh, then, then that should be maybe expected. It will be a bad thing if they're not. With me is Yvonne Seeler, and Yvonne is, uh, as several people have said this week, joined at the hip with me. Uh, she is the product uh, lead and product owner on our 3D scene layers team, and then she's also had experience with what other things? Um, uh, mainly mapping. No. So I started out with uh, the 2D world and now completely moved over to 3D. Yes, but I understand originally you came to Esri to work on 3D. That's true, but it took a long time <laughs> for me to get there. All right, so great. All right, so uh, we are definitely going to try to keep a couple minutes at the end for questions, so we'll probably hold questions till then, but we can go back on anything in the, the topic. So just let me know if, uh, if you see something that you want to come back to and, and revisit. Are you guys already, how many people are already using 3D in ArcGIS? Okay, actually, wow, that's, that's a big change from a couple of years ago. Um, a couple of years ago, it would have been uh, just a couple of people. Um, how many people have customers who are using, you know, even customers in your own organization who are asking you for 3D? So, all right, good, good, that's good to see. How about, uh, how many people know what I3S is? I3S, all right. Only the, the, the Esri France guy, and okay, and this gentleman here knows what it is. But that's, that's good, hopefully we'll change that today. How about working with VR or AR? No? Okay, all right, done. Some little bit of interest there. And how about BIM data? Who doesn't know what BIM data is? All right, BIM data is uh, building information modeling data that is used in the engineering construction industry, and, uh, and we're being forced to do a lot more with it because of customer demand. Um, and then how many people are working with subsurface? All right. Believe it or not, I have a slide for you today, at least one. I've been harassed before because I didn't even have a slide for subsurface stuff, so, so hopefully make people a little bit happy today. All right, so why are we doing 3D, right? I, it, it shouldn't even be really necessary to say, but I still do have to give presentations where I'm explaining to people why 3D is important. Okay. So if we look out to 2030, um, we see all kinds of statistics, but I still like to use some of them to frame why I'm doing things and why I'm pushing for certain things. If we look out to, to 2030, what we see is there are going to be 8.5 billion people on the planet. There are going to be 125 billion connected devices of all kinds, and yet there is only going to be one planet. One way to, to think about this is that we're going to have a tidal wave. We already have a tidal wave of data that is coming our way that we have to make sense out of as smart cities, as smart campuses, as utilities engineers, as, as, as GIS professionals. And we're going to need tools to help us make sense out of all this data. And what I'd like to simply point out is that there's kind of like a unique key for accessing any particular thing that's happening around the world at any one time. And that unique key is really made up of the people it's happening to, the things that it's happening around, and the location where it happens. Actually, if you add time onto that, you can say there are four parts of the key, but it's, it's nicer to put three on a slide. But so, so people, things, and location really are, if you think about tying those three things together, those make up the unique key for asking questions about the world around us. And they're going to be very important in the future when we have a hundred or a thousand or a million times as much data coming in every day as we do now. Um, I, I saw something recently where we generate about 1.7 gigabytes of data on ourselves on the internet a day without even trying. And it's going to be much higher in the future. All right. 3D, in particular, has brought us, Esri, and the GIS community massive amounts of new data that we need to digest and make sense of. From LiDAR data to IoT sensor data to subsurface uh, fracking and oil well data, geology data, all kinds of stuff. There's, there's a ton more data that we're starting to see that really is pushing us to handle 3D. Data availability is driving demand for new GIS experiences as well, as well as other consumerization of 
of other technologies like AR and VR, those are also driving demand. So two things are happening. One, you've got new data that can be used in these experiences, and then the ease of achieving some of these experiences is, is happening quite quickly. It's happening, it's been there becoming easier. Uh, and then 3D, so I'll talk about 3D. Some people ask me why I don't talk about 4D or 5D, or I actually saw one of our competitors using the term 9D recently. And, uh, and the reason that I talk about 3D is because, you know, my sister can understand 3D, and she doesn't work in GIS or in any 3D related thing, right? We, we all, as, as humans, and we see 3D games and movies, we have a common, uh, common language for how we actually are able to talk about different types of experiences. And so I'll talk about 3D. But 3D allows me to tie out to immersiveness, consumer level usability, visually compelling experiences, uh, experiences being deep and smart, uh, experiences being real time, and, and even mobile experiences. All these other things that I know people are expecting today. So 3D for me, and, and saying that GIS is just 3D, has really been a sneak attack on me kind of just having influence over everything. As we, but just anyway, Yvonne says no, he's not. All right, so 3D itself does have some slightly different value propositions from classic 2D. How many of, of you guys remember the old, you know, the business value of GIS books, right? Do you, do you remember that? Back in the day, and, and maybe I'm older than I look, but back in the 90s, there used to be all these books that Esri and others pumped out trying to justify the existence of 2D GIS. And if you go back to some of those books, they often had a lot of kind of business report type value props where you could use GIS analysis to generate spreadsheets. And that's really what it was a lot about. The map at the end of the day there was often the end output, the, the icing on the cake of what the real business value was. In 3D, what we find is that people are actually bringing us new value props for using GIS data that didn't exist for 2D. So one of the things that I would have said 10 years ago was kind of fantasy land, and I did say 10 years ago was fantasy land, but, but I've actually had customers now tell me is that 3D allows them to have a more accurate representation of their real world. And then we also know that 3D allows you to visualize features that either don't exist or that can't be seen. We know that 3D is much better for communication uh, with non-technical stakeholders. And I've seen that, um, I can't tell you the number of different ways that I've seen that. People understand 3D visuals of, of locations because they live in a, in a 3D experience. And then 3D is also useful for analyzing behavior and aesthetics. You know, what does that brick, that new brick facade look like in 2D? What does the door swing really, how, how, you know, how does that door swing really work in 2D? And so, so 3D has its own intrinsic value props, and, and these are some of the reasons for why we see our customers and our other users and our, our organizations demanding. Okay, so my role is to focus on 3D across ArcGIS. Uh, as I've already said, GIS is just 3D. Uh, it's 3D is not something new, it's not an extension, it is modern GIS is 3D. Esri is focused on delivering 3D experiences across the full platform using our web ser WebGIS services-based architecture. We're using 3D to help us come up with new clients and experiences. I have an ArcGIS Earth mobile 3D experience on my Android that's going to go out in, uh, in alpha pretty soon. We're focused on workflow modernization around GIS uh, practices. And, and something that I personally focus on is kind of driving my, my product managers and teams to work on more story-driven solutions and products that kind of close the last mile for our customers. All right, uh, some terminology that, uh, and these slides will all be uh, available after the show, so you can always go back to the, the slides and grab them if you want. But it helps just to clarify, so web scenes are collections of layers, environment settings, and uh, slides, and, and in the future animation that are transportable across different parts of the, the platform. You can publish a web scene to online and then read it from ArcGIS Pro. You can read it from ArcGIS Earth on a mobile device uh, the, in alpha. You can read it in a, in a web browser. And you can do other things with it up in online. In the, in the not too distant future, we're also talking about rolling out mobile scene packages where I could then possibly look at that web scene, download a chunk of it, and then publish it on a device that's going to be used in a disadvantaged network. In a situation, right? So that, that's, that's something that we're planning for late this year, but it's basically a, a, a persistence mechanism for, for web scene content. 
And then scene layers themselves are much like feature layers. They describe a, a single data type, a single data package that, that is kind of internally consistent today in the way we think about it. But that it's structured in a way that, uh, that when you're looking at it in a mobile device experience or browser experience, you're not bringing in all 120 gigabytes of the scene layer at once. You're bringing in the five megabytes that you need to see in that view. And then when you move around, you'll, you'll pull in the other content that, that is, is still out there waiting for you to retrieve it. Um, scene layers are, uh, I'll, talk, I'll talk a little bit more about it in a second, but scene layers are now uh, in the open specification through OGC, and, uh, and we're seeing a lot of great adoption by partners. All right, so a little bit more uh, terminology. So I3S is actually the name that we'll use for the Index 3D scene layer specification. So everybody else now in the room who didn't hold up their hand earlier can now say they know what I3S is. It's, it's a lot more complicated than this, obviously. But in terms of usage, it isn't that complicated. So it's an open specification. It was originally shared under the Creative Commons licensing. Uh, we, uh, now it's also available under an OGC license. Um, it describes a scalable scene cache with attributes and indexing. Um, it has multiple levels of detail. Uh, so that means that when you're far away, you, you think you see the building, but we don't stream in all the building detail when you're far away because you really couldn't see that from far away. Anyway. Um, it can be streamed over the internet or used locally on a disk, and, uh, and there's the opportunity for us to expand it in the future. And we'd love to hear about uh, directions that folks would like it expanded. It was adopted through the OGC Community Standard process. Um, this was a great team effort by a bunch of uh, companies, and, and including Esri. And, uh, and you know, I really think some, we, we couldn't have done it without some of the partner effort from folks like Vricon and, and even Bentley, who uh, now serves out I3S in the Context Capture app. So yeah, so we've had really great 3D uh, adoption of I3S by third parties. Um, I'm not going to go into this too much more, but uh, you can actually find Nearmap and Vricon and a few other folks who are using I3S down on the show floor, and I encourage you to visit their booths. Uh, more deeply than just I3S, the 3D team is really committed to the open strategy that Esri has. Um, we, uh, and actually uh, myself directly, uh, have been responsible for driving increased adoption of KML at Esri through the ArcGIS Earth effort. Uh, we have created new packaging, uh, I'm sorry, uh, compression mechanisms for uh, point clouds and for raster data that we've then released under uh, open licensing. And then we've got tons of open service endpoints and all kinds of other stuff that, that people can use to innovate, to be con confident that they'll get access to their data, and to, uh, to connect to other applications to, to interoperability. On the desktop, what you'll find is that we have two major desktop tools that are for real GIS users. Um, the the G users who know their GIS users, how's that? Um, so ArcGIS Pro is our powerful 2D, 3D integrated desktop tool that is kind of like the workhorse tool for GIS people who need to author 2D and 3D content. Our uh, City Engine is still out there. We still have an active development team on it and it was repurposed in the last couple of years or redirected at, at its biggest market segment, which was urban planning and urban design. So City Engine has really been refocused on that market and they've been doing a lot of development to, to really make it a lot better for that market. ArcGIS Pro uh, has a whole bunch of great new functionality in the last, since the last UC. One of the things that uh, we're really happy to see roll out is so, you know, folks have been able to interact with, uh, with 3D in computer games since I think it was 1992 that Doom came out. And, and I remember playing that on a local area network set up in somebody's home where we were shooting each other and yelling from different rooms. Well, if I could shoot people and blow things up in 3D in 1992, then why can't I do it in 2018, I'm old. Uh, uh, in my GIS experience with my authoritative source of record GIS content, right? So that, that, the idea behind the exploratory analysis tools is that you should be able to have your scene content in Pro or in other applications and actually conduct a line of sight, a view shed, uh, create a view dome, or do things like slice through the data with a, a plane or another volume. Right, so you have a building, you want to slice downward to the building to see the floors floor by floor, why shouldn't you be able to do that? You can do that now. I really encourage you to, to check it out and to try it. 
works great in Pro. I've already had this question today. It, it does not require any extra licensing than just in Pro, right? So 3D is, GIS is 3D. We're trying to make as much of this functionality available to you in our 3D core package. Okay. In the future, we're going to look at a lot of other things, uh, including uh, uh, elevation and, uh, and some flooding tools and other things like that. I, I also want to mention that the interactive tools are also available in the ArcGIS runtime for developers. The, the web scene team, scene viewer team, has started rolling out some interactive tools. And then uh, ArcGIS Earth is going to have uh, interactive profile, view shed line of sight in, at the end of the summer. And if I can show the profile, if I have time at the end, I will. It's really fantastic. Um, so then 3D editing, uh, a lot of folks asked us, uh, why can't I do more SketchUp-like stuff in ArcGIS Pro when we first rolled it out? You can do a little bit of pseudo SketchUp stuff in, in City Engine. Um, they made that better, and then we basically took some of that stuff and put it in ArcGIS Pro. So you can sketch walls, you can, you can create building shapes in Pro now. It's not meant to be a, uh, it's not meant to be a, a replacement for SketchUp or definitely not a replacement for uh, Revit or anything like that. Uh, the, the architecture tool from uh, uh, Autodesk. But what you are able to do, which is one of my hobbies, is I take graffiti photos when I travel. I travel a lot as a product manager, and I was able to take uh, some pretty cool graffiti photos and just in literally like two minutes, the first time I ever touched the functionality, slap them on the sides of walls in ArcGIS Pro. So, uh, and, and really, it, in, in terms of like just making 3D experiences look better, which a lot of things, a lot of times people are just using 3D to make a scene to communicate something. It really can close the gap between somebody thinking this is just yellow cube building versus actually making it look like it's something realistic. So um, I encourage you all as well to try the editing capability. There's an editing grid. Um, you can edit against uh, multi patch point and feature services. And you can do a lot of other stuff now with it. And we'll be making it better. There's the, there were geometric effects in 2D available in Pro early on, and in the last year or so, we, we also extended these to 3D. Um, I encourage you to look at uh, some of Nathan Shepard's demos. He does some really great job with them. Uh, in the session that we did earlier on Pro specifically, uh, he does a great demo where he shows a drone flight path, but then he uses the cartographic tools to actually show you which direction the flight path was happening and how fast the drone was moving. So, good stuff. Animation. Um, back in the 70s, I think it was Cornell that was the first group to uh, generate a 3D uh, bitmap image and save it to disk or, or anything like that, and it was of a building. And I think that the, what I tell people is that when they then generated another image of that building from a slightly different viewpoint, that was the first and shortest uh, video ever created. And so people have been creating videos from 3D since the dawn of 3D. Early on, it was partly because it was the only shareable medium where somebody else could look at it. Uh, but now what we see is people are able to use, go jump right into Pro, use our not-so-new-anymore animation tools, but they're very easy to use for, for GIS professionals like us, and then and create a movie. And if they want, they can act, Nathan actually uses, uh, our colleague uses the animation tools in Pro to do his executive demos now, internally because he doesn't have to worry about his mouth shaking or anything like that, right? He just pushes play and it goes to the next step and he pushes the next step. You guys can do the same thing. If you have, so what a lot of architects use animation like this for is they've got a building, maybe the whole building isn't finished in the model or maybe there's some stuff they don't want people to focus on. They'll go generate a flight path, generate a video, and they'll share that video with their customers. So they're able to control the visual experience that the customers have, right? So videos are very useful for communication and, and for guiding people through an experience that you want them to have. And you can do all kinds of great stuff with uh, screen overlays and placing text and, and all kinds of good stuff like that. Uh, the scene layers, one of the big things that, that the team that Yvonne works with uh, did in the last year is, is we, are, we added these new scene layers a couple of years ago. And when you add something new like this, it takes it time to catch up to the layer functionality of other layers. So one of the things that we've added is the ability to do a very basic GIS thing, which is to set symbology on the scene layers. And um, anything more you want to say about that right now? Yep. 
So basically, um, anything that is for smart mapping, for visualization, for feature-based scene layers like 3D objects and point scene layers, we now support like what you, your classic unique values uh, classification using visual variables across the platform. You can basically use it the same way as you use any other layer type. And this is our big goal that scene layers is nothing exotic. It's, it's just a layer. Yes. So a good example, for example, for is uh, you can now, because of what we've released recently, you can bring in Revit data, treat it as GIS features, and then apply GIS symbology to the features in there. And that's something that it's a really basic thing that people have been asking me for for about 12 years. So it's really nice to be able to see it happen uh, this year. We, there are some things that are pseudo 3D that I don't always talk about, but I, I will point out. Um, we did release a new oblique imagery workflow uh, last winter. It's really kind of cool. Uh, you can actually go into image space in Pro and actually do some feature creation and, uh, and mensuration and data collection in there. Um, you know, a lot of the, the, uh, like the intelligence agencies and others use, are often looking at oblique imagery that, that looks really ugly if you, uh, if you try to orthorectify it. And, uh, and so now you actually can go and work in this image space experience. We also have the ability to go and create a stereo view. There are some really fancy stereo uh, monitors out there. And one of the exciting things, kind of silly, but exciting things for me at our Dev Summit was we had this very fancy monitor. I had never tried uh, bringing up certain data types in Pro using it before. And it just it worked right away without us even having to set any configuration switches or anything. So there's a lot of other hidden stuff in Pro to make the 3D experience uh, possible in different ways. Um, another thing that we've been doing a lot with in the last couple of years is uh, is extending the capabilities of point clouds for specifically for for distributing them over the web. We added a point cloud layer type to i3s, and the largest one I've seen so far is 420 billion. Points. I think that was about a terabyte and a half in, in uh, scene layer package size. I can bring it up later if I have time. It, you can go find it up on ArcGIS Online. And you know what? You can stream it into the web browser on your phone. Right? And it doesn't stream in all 1.3 terabytes. It just streams in the, the points that you happen to be in range of that. So, so it's really, really, this is really great. Uh, what I told folks is that I have had customers that have had point cloud data sitting on drives probably since the early 1990s that have gone unused, and then, or tapes in that case maybe. But we actually now have the ability to give them a whole new use of that data. And then one of the things that we'll be looking at in the near future is hooking up analysis capabilities against those. So it's something that Yvonne and I, uh, we're responsible for pushing for essentially. So, so all right. Uh, 3D Analyst is still out there. Um, 3D Analyst, uh, that team is, is focused on, uh, on giving you the ability to do more and more um, kind of synchronous analy analysis tasks. So things like identifying an AOI that you're interested in and then calculating what, are, what other areas in the scene can view that AOI from there. So they've been adding tools. They've been adding things uh, like the ability to project the color from an image underneath LiDAR onto the LiDAR, right? A lot of LiDAR, especially some of the older stuff, is an RGB. The RGB LiDAR often looks a little bit better if we're just trying to put it in a scene as context. So now you can take even, you can take Esri's uh, world imagery service and actually project that onto the, onto the, your LiDAR point cloud. So, and then from there you can generate a scene layer from it and share it out as context. So, so lots of good stuff there that they're doing. Okay, so I'm going to switch and talk about the city engine a little bit, and I'm going to try to go a little bit quickly because I want to give Yvonne plenty of time to, to demo here. But as I said, there's way more stuff than I can talk about in, uh, in, in an hour here. So city engine's still out there. It's really, it has been repurposed to really focus in on urban design. Um, some of the things that they're specifically looking at are the conceptual planning workflows, site planning workflows, um, big master planning workflows, and then They've also been looking at adjacent experiences such as VR and AR that some of our like city planning customers are asking us to add on to the, the city planning workflow. They have their own version of the uh, interactive analytical tools. One of the things that they've done is uh, there's a lot of similar interaction to create the, 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 
the, the, the objects in scene, but then they've actually added in some analytics that get output because people want to do things, for example, like figure out what percentage of the park is visible or, uh, or you know, other things like that. So, um, so it's a different, a little bit different uh, output experience, but it's because we're tailoring that experience for, for urban planning. Uh, here's another example where they're, this is their V-Dome, they're, they're able to, uh, to spit out some statistics on that as well, and then to actually generate a spherical image, or a columnar image, I guess, uh, showing you the whole panorama around that point. So different things that they've been asked for from some other customers. They, so City Engine is, un, underneath is a procedural graphic generation technology uh, that, is, that really was what it originally was. So you can take and generate building structures or road structures or other things from simple geometries to start off with along with rules. And, and I'm happy to see they're doing things like allowing you to place repeated items along linear features, um, not lines, but the edges of linear, long linear polygons. Uh, they're working on the lines. But uh, the guardrails in this case were an example of placing linear features, but this is something that uh, some of their users have asked for for a while. And then I'd shown this image earlier under the new experiences. Uh, you can go downstairs and actually uh, try out at the 3D showcase a VR experience that the, the team has been working on. It's, uh, I believe that the one that they've got down there is a kind of a multiplayer game experience. And it, it's, it's pretty, pretty interesting to see how multiple people could interact around a tabletop, actually mixed reality version of a city model, looking at it in, in this virtual experience. And so if, you've got, if you have the chance, I'd go down and check it out. Uh, they also are the team primarily driving uh, uh, game engine integration. So we're getting a lot of uh, demand for game engines. Uh, Unreal Engine, Epic Games uh, now has a whole new division focused on non-gaming uh, game engine uses. Uh, my former boss is the, the lead of it. And, uh, and we are working with them and we're also working with uh, the Unity team a little bit to basically allow you folks to take your 3D GIS authoritative content and move it more easily into game engine experiences. So, and there are many different reasons for why people want to do that. Okay, so uh, for City Engine, what they're working on next is things like allowing you to create tile packages from imagery in that experience, because sometimes that's necessary when you want to make modifications and then uh, use it in your alternative design. They're working more on drawing tools, expanding their rule library, and they're, uh, one of the big things for them is trying to move their 360 VR experience into production. And they want to they move it to some different platforms to do that. We have other things that we count as apps. Uh, ArcGIS Earth, as an example, is one of the apps that I've been focused on the last few years. It has been a desktop app up until this summer where we're going to start to release uh, ArcGIS Earth on a mobile device. A drone map is out there still. Um, then we have web apps like Web App Builder and the apps you can create using that. Uh, GeoPlanner 3D and all kinds of other stuff that it's, goes beyond just the desktop experience of Pro and City Engine. Okay, um, ArcGIS Earth, uh, I'm gonna jump over these a little bit, but it basically was created as a consistent experience for desktop users, of largely of Google Earth. Uh, when Google announced they were pulling out of the enterprise market, we had some customers that basically asked us if we could provide something uh, that could replace it. And so far we've had pretty good success. There's still some things that we're working on to make that replacement complete, but it's, uh, it's been a really good effort and we've gotten lots of positive feedback. Um, Earth Mobile, I, I can show it if I have time later, it works on my phone. You can access extremely large uh, scene layers with it. I earlier was downstairs at the Brycon booth showing those guys that I could actually jump between one ceiling layer that's like 120 gigabytes and another one that's like 17 gigabytes on different parts of the world right in that little mobile experience and just view what I wanted in those. Uh, obviously wasn't over the conference center Wi-Fi downloading, uh, you know, 135 gigabytes of content. I was just accessing the content that I needed. Drone map is still out there. Um, it is, uh, it's, it allows you to create TD and 3 products from drone imagery. It's really been focused on kind of an asset inspection workflow. And I think we'll see some interesting changes uh, over that in the next couple of years as they focus more and more on that inspection workflow. 
360 VR I've talked about a little bit. Um, if you're interested in 360 VR, I would encourage you to get out to the showcase and ask about it. Okay, the last thing, uh, so I'm just going to say, oh, I'm, I'm talking more slides on the online stuff. So I, I don't really talk about online and enterprise too much, except to say that for 3D, we're focused on making the experience equivalent. Uh, given our release timings, where sometimes the releases are a little bit off from each other. And the enterprise packaging that we rolled out a year or so ago is very important because before then we had to talk about the different components you needed for 3D. If you want to use 3D, you have to use the full enterprise package, meaning you have to use portal in that enterprise deployment. You can't just use server. So that's why I was very happy about the repackaging because I can tell people if you need 3D on-premises, you have to use Enterprise. So just think about that. I know we've, uh, we've made some quiet announcements about allowing Pro to work against feature services that in, in server. That will not work for the 3D stuff. You have to be using the portal information model. If you have any questions about that, you can follow up with me. We have a robust JavaScript capability for 3D that works on desktops, browsers, and on mobile devices. Um, we could all right now go out to ArcGIS Online on our phones and pop open a web scene. And they work great, they look great. Um, I would love some feedback on them. The team uh, limited the UI, the user experience a little bit, I think a little bit too much. So I'd love some feedback on that so we can give it to the team and, and ask them to maybe rethink a little bit of the UI. But uh, you can also build custom web apps that work on mobile devices. So you could actually go rebuild an app with your own UI. Um, we have a full stack of capability in JavaScript that goes from our API to widgets that we provide to scene viewer, map viewer, and then up to support apps like Story Maps and Web App Builder, uh, additional widgets, and then things like Ops Dashboard and GeoPlanner. And there's a lot more information on this up there, out there, and uh, and then these links will be in the presentation for you guys to get. All right. Um, we also do provide content. We have a, a, the, the second highest hit uh, service in ArcGIS Online, Living Atlas, is actually our World Elevation service. Uh, recently, that was updated with, uh, with Airbus content that's at 24 meter posting globally. Uh, with, uh, we have some higher, uh, smaller posting data sets for the uh, UK and, and some other areas where they share it out as open data. We're looking at pushing beyond that, but right now, uh, in terms of elevation services that you can access from anywhere, we have the highest res that you can get uh, and use in your app. So I know there's one or two others out there, and we share this out for any ArcGIS developer we use. And some people are able to use it for free, because if you sign up for developer licensing and you build certain kinds of apps, you can use it for free. All right, so last slide for me, enhancement for underground workflows. So people have been asking me for about two years, three years actually, for the ability to navigate underground and global scenes in the web. You can do that now. You can also change the ground transparency to be completely transparent without that stupid grid that we had, right? So unfortunately, the grid was a, a misinterpretation of an idea that I'd asked for, and it, I didn't get what I asked for, and then we got stuck with it for a while. I'm glad it's gone. I'm sure our users are glad it's gone. And now you can even turn the whole ground off if you want. So, um, so I encourage you to play with that if you need it. Uh, then uh, there is a new user experience for working with elevation surfaces and surfaces in general in ArcGIS Pro. We've exposed it more so that you don't have to go into the properties to access your, your surfaces. And then, uh, as I pointed out before, the interactive tools work with both above and below ground content. And then we are doing more things to look at underground workflows, including Jack mentioned it a couple times on stage. He kind of misphrased it, but a, a, a voxel scene layer that we're working on that is going to be for grid-based voxelized content. And, uh, and it's pretty, uh, pretty interesting. Um, there may be a picture of it in a later slide just to say what's next. All right, so now we're going to go to Yvonne, and that's enough of me talking. I hope I've left you enough time. So. Oh yeah, we are already at my, at my screen. All right, uh, I want to give you a, a small presentation of uh, scene layers. And as Chris has pointed out, uh, scene layers are the way you can share really large amount of 3D content across the platform. In today's demo, I want to show you what we have accomplished in Axios Pro 2.2 and uh, Enterprise 10.6.1. 
I have structured uh, it into the typical tasks uh, we believe uh, our users are executing, from authoring to consumption and exploration of scene layers, as well as maintenance of scene layers. So I'm going to start here with the authoring part. And the user's journey usually starts with um, Actress Pro, because there I can easily share uh, web scenes or any web layer uh, to Actress Online or Enterprise. So one way is, for example, as I have it here, I have a fully authored um, scene. It includes uh, buildings of New York. Uh, I have trees. I even have point cloud data. I decided that I only want to show the buildings. And now what I can do is I can go to share, and I can say share as web scene, and that opens the share as web scene doc pane for me. I can go ahead and uh, give it a proper summary, not just A at here in my case. I can share with whoever I want to share, for example, for everybody or specific to my enterprise uh, uh, ArcGIS that I have here. I can even, you know, have a change capabilities for the layers that are participating in this uh, web scene. When I share as a web scene all scene layers that I'm creating that are of the type 3D objects, basically multi-point patch feature classes that I'm sharing or points, they become scene layers with an associated feature layer. So we are creating the I3S service and the feature service and we are connecting them to give uh, this scene layer more capabilities. For example, now I can have um, richer statistical information that I can use for symbology or if I want to uh, use a query definition. Or I can actually view the attribute table as I sh uh, can show you later um, when I have uh, the scene layer open. Or I can even go as far and maintain the data by being able to edit them and update uh, my, my scene layer cache afterwards. So this is what I would do if I um, want to copy all my data over to Actios Online or my enterprise geodatabase and I have everything the way I want. I share it as a web scene. In other cases, I might actually just want to share a web layer. So for example, here I have uh, data from Lyon. Um, they are quite big and have uh, heavy textures, so I usually always turn it off before I publish it because I'm not really sharing a web scene. Uh, I'm really just sharing the layer and I can always turn it on when I'm actually consuming it. And uh, when I look at the uh, share as a web layer, I have the ability to uh, to share it by reference. And what that means is that I'm not copying my data over. My data actually stay, in my case, within my enterprise geodatabase, or they, they stay in a file geodatabase. And I have the advantage that I don't have to copy extra data. So this whole publishing uh, process, of course, is faster um, than if I would put everything up on, uh, on my portal. And here, the same way, I can uh, give it some tags and I can configure it. And as I have mentioned before, uh, if I have a 3D object or point scene layer that I share by reference, um, I can um, actually make it editable. So for example, here I go into my configuration and I configure my layer properties. And here for the associated web feature operations, I can actually turn on editing. I can then also allow updating of the geometry. I can say, okay, I want to you know, allow the, the export of the data and so forth. And as um, in, in every sharing uh, operation, I can of course analyze my data and see, you know, if there are any problems and then I can publish them. In another case, I might actually want to take advantage of uh, the high performance of scene layers uh, within Actios Pro and create a scene layer package. So I can inspect the data before I actually really um, upload them and publish them to Actios Online or uh, Enterprise. And this is especially useful when I'm working with point cloud data. So in my next example, that should look familiar to you guys. Um, this is the user conference uh, center. And uh, last year, um, uh, Trimble actually went through and created an interior point cloud from the uh, island area. And I have it. Um, let me go 
inside and just show you the, um, the, the, the interior point cloud. So in ActiOS Pro 2.1 already, we worked on uh, improving our algorithm to not just uh, you know, use um, uh, airborne LiDAR, but also interior LiDAR to actually create this kind of point clouds. And now you can see, uh, I can just, uh, well, you see the, the Trimble sign. Um, there are a couple of people down here. They did, they did it while, um, while everybody was uh, on the island. Um, I can also just view from, uh, from up high above. I can zoom in and I can you know, start just looking around. And as for any other you know, point cloud, of course, I can change the appearance, for example. There are a lot more uh, interior point clouds now out there than uh, we have seen before. So we really want to uh, allow users to bring this kind of content to ArcGIS and share with their users uh, across the platform. But we also realized that there are a lot of LiDAR data out there that you know, couldn't really so easily uh, be integrated into ArcGIS. So what we also did in Act uh, 2.1 um, 2 already we have, we have different types of um, point cloud data that you can bring in. So for example, ZLAS, what is an S3 uh, provided format, LAS or LAS-Z, like in this, uh, in this case, this uh, data from Denmark, where we had a LAS-Z uh, data and we could just create a point cloud scene layer from it. And I have the same capabilities uh, as for any other um, last data set, for example, uh, usually my default is elevation, but I can also change it, for example, to RGB. Um, and of course, uh, you can, you know, use uh, last data set layers. Now in 2.2, you even can share it directly. So if it's part of your web scene, you can just share it out within the web scene. You don't have to create an SLPK up front. Um, you, you share directly to ActiOS Online or Enterprise. Another tool that we have added, and I will just show you um, where it is in the geoprocessing dog pane, is the ability to create integrated mesh scene layers. So before, uh, only third-party vendors could actually create this kind of data, but now if you, for example, have an OSGB data set, uh, unfortunately, I have nothing where I have rights to to show you, otherwise I would have uh, shown you one. But if you have OSGB files, you can just take them and you can create an integrated mesh uh, from it. So it's a very quick and easy way to get this kind of data into first ArcGIS Pro and then share it across the platform. So this was the creation part of scene layers and it, it basically works for any other layer type. But often after you know, I have created it, what people then really want to do is they want to view it in the web. So Pro is not necessarily the, the first uh, viewing uh, client um, that our uh, uh, are, are using. So now when I'm going here to, uh, to my website, I have this data from Lyon that I showed you earlier. And just with a couple of clicks, I can just create a, um, a nice looking thematic map. So I have here the, the city itself. I can, as I said, everything was uh, turned off. I can now start turning on the layers. Um, I have some uh, attributes available here for the buildings uh, about some, some noise uh, uh, that is, uh, is, is captured here. Um, I can change um, the color and uh, for example I can say okay I, I don't want to have the, the textures colored I really just want the color and of course I can say as well that I want to have the edges by the way everything I do here I can do in Pro 2 so we really try hard to keep everything in sync so that you know anything you do in one, on, on one end you should be able to do on the other one as well so after I'm done with this, I can actually go in and I can really view uh, my data. And of course, I could also now start measuring and so forth. And as you can see, with just a couple of clicks, um, I have created a thematic map using scene layers. 
Um, if uh, I want to um, do this a little bit more sophisticated, I can, for example, also create a web application. So a colleague of mine from the JavaScript API team has created one with the uh, New York data that I showed you before. So in here, it's, again, it's a scene that is used for this application. And when I click on it, I get basically the information for specific buildings. So this is one way that you know, I can use um, building information, for example, uh, using scene layers within uh, the web scene viewer. But beside consuming, people also want to, to explore data. So for example, here I have again the data of Lyon. And as uh, Chris has mentioned, we have now the, um, the uh, interactive tools. They are here within analysis and I can you know, choose between line of sight, the view dome, slice, or a view shed. Often what people asked us before is, oh, I actually just want to see the attributes and I want to see it in the attribute as I'm used to from other layer types. So what we did for 3D objects and point scene layers that have uh, associated feature layers to allow you to uh, view the attribute table. For example, if I go here into the table for uh, the Leon trees, the attribute table of the associated feature layer comes up. And then, for example, if I go here to data and I'm selecting a tree, I can actually see this within my attribute table. So this is all connected. So our goal is we don't want you to learn anything new. Anything that you already know and all the workflows you're using for your other layer types that have points or 3D objects in it or multi-patches, all these workflows you should still be able to do. And now I can even go a step further and for example, I can edit this within the attribute table. So I will make this a little smaller and this is updating the row and it's also updating my feature itself. Beside editing in the attribute table, what I can also do is I can create new features. So for example, I'm going here to my buildings and I start editing. I want to create new buildings. Am I still on? Okay, can you all hear me? I, I, I noticed that sometimes it goes a little off. Okay, no, I'm still on. You bet it's, maybe that's what it is. The battery goes out from time to time. So I'm, I'm the master in editing, by the way, as you can see. Um, but basically what it comes down to is the same editing experience that you have for um, any other layer, you have it here too. And it shows directly within the, um, uh, the scene layer. So for example, if I'm now, let's say, let me uh, clear the selection and going, I'm going all big. So this is basically the city of Lyon and I have um, added some features to it. Because I am an editor and when I edit, when I use this data in Actress Pro as an editor, I can do this kind of operation. Any of my users out there that are actually consuming the scene layer in a web scene viewer or somewhere else, they see these updates when I'm actually rebuilding my cache. So what I have to do as a next step, I would go into my portal and I would manage my cache and I would update the cache. And with this, all the changes I have done would be visible for everybody else. If I want something that you take out from this very little demonstration, I'm clear, I, I just want to give you an idea of what we have done new is we want that all the workflows that you're used to for feature layers, for, uh, for multi-patches, this needs to be uh, available for scene layers as well. And the uh, 
really this uh, working with uh, large uh, 3D content that we make that possible for you. So all your great feedback of the needs and uh, things that you want to have improved is really helping us uh, to make this a better product. So thank you. Thanks, Yvonne. I So I get to be a little bit more eye candy-ish uh, than Yvonne does because I'm the product manager and she's got to work on the actual cheese making itself. So I just wanted to actually, no, I'm just kidding, but go ahead. To be honest, when I created this, I you are not the first one who tells me I give boring demos. <laughs> I didn't say that. You didn't hear me say that. But when I heard that the first time, I thought I nailed it. There is nothing, you know, basically what I got from a colleague saying, hey, there's nothing new. We can do all this with feature layers, but this is the goal. We don't want to interrupt your workflows. We really want this to be the same experience as for any other layer type. So and that is exactly my right. excuse. That's exactly right. All right. So I, I'm just going to show you a couple other things that have been talked about or shown at the conference that are, this is a little bit more ad hoc and uh, that, are, that may be of interest for some folks. So I, early on, I asked what's, if, if any, everybody knew what BIM was, and there was a couple uh, a couple hands went up, but people didn't know. So BIM is a big domain uh, impacting trillions of dollars of investment in assets around the world. And it's used both to refer to a different data types, to some software products, such as some software products created by Autodesk, our partner, and then also uh, to a, a, a process of program execution for the execution of, or creation of assets, renovation, destruction of assets. And one, one of the things that happened when we started saying that we could allow you to stream large amounts of 3D content through GIS is that we were talking about points, lines, polygons, yellow cubes, and billboarded symbols. But what users started doing was immediately trying to shove whole buildings of 3D content literally into Esri. It didn't work. Um, and, uh, and, and even some folks inside Esri said, we don't want that. We should just tell people not to do it. But uh, there are a few of us who recognize that this was not only an inevitable data type we would have to digest, but an important data type because of the, the massive amount of impact on the earth that is happening through construction and, uh, and asset-related activity around the world. So this is a, a fantastic story where uh, Don Keeney, the product manager who uh, works for me uh, covering CAD and, and BIM stuff, uh, he... he um, put out a call for BIM data about a year ago, and he got some before we could do anything with it. This was Revit content in this case. He had a file folder full of about 50 Revit files that were related for the Nashville airport. He uh, created a little GP tool once we had some capability to read the data, uh, put the data into a geo database, and then published it. It did take him a whole weekend to publish it, but it just spun, worked over the weekend, and when he came in on Monday, he said, I, I, we had a meeting and then we walked back to our offices, which were right next to each other, and he said, wow, that was great. And I thought, you know, well, the meeting wasn't that good, but whatever. And then a couple minutes later, he comes and gets me and he shows me that this data had published ArcGIS online over the weekend and it just worked. In this case, what I've done is I've taken the data he published to ArcGIS online and I brought it back into to ArcGIS Pro and I can use it in here just like GIS data. I can turn stuff on and off, actually that's the interior, so we won't see it. But so I can turn off the exterior. I shouldn't have done that in Pro, should I? It's gonna, it's gonna cycle back. Okay, there, it went off. And so we see the interiors, and now I'm gonna bring the exteriors back on. And it takes a sec to, to uh, show that cache. I can use the animation tools with it, so I earlier, uh, in a different demo, just set up a really quick animation, and I'll show you why in a sec. So remember I said sometimes you use animation for presentation, so I'm the program manager at the airport. I want to show you the great work that we've been doing and how the airport is looking these days. I fly you around here and, uh, and you can see the very nice looking airport. And then when it's all done, uh, you've just seen exactly what I wanted you to see. And what I didn't want you to see is that Don had no control over this data. And unfortunately, some architect left a big uh, curtain wall. <laughs> Um, you know, just an artifact in one of the drawings, and we can't edit that. We'd have to go into Reddit, Revit to edit it, but I was able to just generate a quick animation that shows you that you can look at the airport, focus your, your uh, build a movie, focus the viewer's eyes on what's important and not actually have it 
uh, jump out at you and get the user stuck on it because we all know our bosses get hung up on artifacts like this. And it's just a fact of life. Customers too. Um, the, uh, th the same data is here in a web scene. So uh, this is this is data being streamed in from ArcGIS Online. There's our big uh, curtain wall thing. Um, I should be able to click on it and, uh, and show you that there are attributes that were pulled in from the process of importing the Revit data. Uh, I can use typical tools that I may be able to uh, use with any other data in this experience. Exactly what Yvonne said, we're trying to give you access to your content just like all of your other GIS content. So in this case, I've got some slides. I could use the interactive shadow tools that are in here. And if I really wanted, now that it's in these formats, I could actually link it out to things like enterprise data in geodatabases or in relational databases. So there's a lot more that can be done with it. I can even use this in my own custom web experience. Okay, so another app just to take a quick look at is ArcGIS Earth. How many people in here have used Earth? Okay, good, that's great. You know what, we don't get enough feedback on Earth. We really don't. The feedback that I hear most often is, it's great and it works for what I want. But I don't get any feedback saying, either it didn't work for this other thing that I would want, or could you also add this? So the team would love to have more feedback. This is the 1.8 release. It's a development build, so if it crashes, please forgive me. Um, but, uh, but I just want to show you, so I think this is actually the largest open pit mine in the world. It's right outside Salt Lake. Uh, it's a good example, though, for uh, some of the new tools that we've got. Oops, actually, there's Bookmark, so I'm going to hide that. So we've got bookmarks that we're adding in. Um, we've also got, this is probably my favorite tool that we've added. So I've got the ability to, uh, to create an, a, uh, an elevation profile. And then, as you can see, it's interactive, so I can actually walk along the profile and show you the grade and the elevation uh, on, that, uh, on that transect there. Um, we are looking at some other workflows, and you can export this as a graphic, and then, uh, and then you can do things, simple things like flip it if you want. Um, we are also looking at exporting that, that line that I just created, but, but segmented up by a meter or five meters to generate a 3D polyline. Had a couple pipeline folks tell me that that would save them hours of work. So, um, so that's something that the team is actually going to try to add into this next release where this is going to show up. Uh, other things that I can do in this release are um, I have bookmarks. I'm, uh, I, let me see. I'll just capture a new one here. So I captured. So I I can move them around. Um, right now, the bookmark stuff is a little bit limited for me in the sense that I've just got one bookmarks set of bookmarks for my entire uh, project but what I what I my entire experience of earth but what I probably really want is different bookmark sets associated with different data types and so that's something that we'll have to work on um, I uh, other things that we have are added are consistent with pro we have now added a 3d measure tool that looks just like the 3d measure tool in pro and in the the, uh, the, the scene viewer so Earth is expanding quite a bit. Um, one last Earth little bit that I'll show you, and thanks for hanging out. I'm sorry, I'm walking with a question time. Does anybody have a question that I can we can answer? Sure, go ahead. So, so kind of actually. Let me flip over to this really quickly. Um, uh, we actually do have uh, do have in the plans some regular graded voxel based capability that could be generated from as derived content from different types of geologic content. So I actually my undergrad is geology and and I've been in the field and done a lot of field mapping and done some surface. Uh, uh, hand-drawn visualizations years ago. I, I definitely understand the need for it. We do have plans for it. Um, it's not, you know, the, a lot like Open Inventor and, and some of those folks, there are some technologies out there, very high-end technologies for server-based generalization of subsurface visualizations, including on-the-fly interpolation and, uh, and voxel-based uh, interaction. That's not something that we have dev plans looking at. Um, what we are trying to do is provide you a, 
a very plausible experience for looking at your subsurface data in GIS, including doing things like changing symbology on those voxels and, and giving you the ability to, uh, to interact with the data with things like the slicing tools. And, but that's, that is a, it's, it's going to always be a little bit different from the, the Open Inventor. Uh, I think GeoVision is another one. Uh, GeoSoft is a partner we have. It's going to always be a little bit different from that because those folks have have specialized tech that works on on uh, on data for part of the market that that uh, that we don't see in large other parts of the market, and there are there are enough of them that it would take us a while to compete to catch up. But this stuff, I and mean, do you want to comment about the, that at all, the voxel stuff at all? Yeah, maybe we talk afterwards. That would be great because uh, this is. Um, as I said, I work in development, so when I saw that these uh, slides are going out, I was like, please don't show it, it's too early. We will, you know, create these great expectations and then, you know, we, we have to deliver on them. So we are still in the, in the, we have a prototype, we are in the planning phase, so that's why any feedback that we can get that basically brings us closer to what we believe is possible, that would be great. Yeah. So it's a, it's Yvonne, a good opportunity for us. Yvonne really didn't want me to show this? So I wouldn't do No. Well, you don't even see what I'm showing. But, uh, but, <laughs> oh uh, now, to be, to be fair, we actually both have been adamant about not saying that this is coming out anytime soon. But this is stuff that's in development right now. Uh, it, it does work. This one is, uh, is a few million points, I think, uh, that are all shown as voxels. You can do on-the-fly slicing. Uh, this one has time, temporal information in it. So as time slices, you can... Uh, you can uh, Ignore the symbology to, uh, and the actually, UI. Yeah, right. There's no UI. Yes, right. This, so this isn't even running inside an Esri client product at this moment. So, but but we do have intentions to roll this out as a as a scene layer type. Um, so it's it's on the plans. I, we would say, in fact, Jack showed it on the near term. Yvonne and I, 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 neither one of us have put it on the near term plan. So I think that was just Jack accelerating it forward. You know, it's, you know he will make uh, us do it, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's what, that's what he does. So he's, he's pretty excited about this. But to be honest, I don't think he's seen these videos. We didn't show him these videos because we felt, if we did, that it would be on the plenary in, you know, on Monday morning. And we this weren't is recorded, by the way. Yes, yes, all right. This is recorded, okay. <laughs> that's all right. I, 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 I'll be fired on Monday. That's all. All right. So cool. Um, last thing that I'll show you is uh, is so I showed you Earth, a couple, couple quick other things. So note with Earth, this is a 120 gigabyte file, and I'm going to drag and drop it in here. And it used to take about 15 seconds to load. It doesn't even take 15 seconds to load anymore. So this is 128 20 gigabytes of Vricon content. Um, the, it is uh, half meter textured mesh content generated from satellite imagery. Actually, I was looking at it in somebody else's demo, and I think I actually identified a crater impact. And I need to go figure out where they were looking at because you can see the, the lines around it. They, they were all uh, concentric circles, and um, I need to go check that out. But uh, but uh, really interesting uh, capabilities to do things like like just quickly add massive amounts of data to really lightweight apps. Earth itself is only 100 megs in size, and yet it can consume a, you know, a terabyte of information sitting there on disk with, without much problem. Uh, very last thing, I, I lied before, we'll see if I can get it to work, is um, we now have, uh, so we now have uh, ArcGIS Earth Mobile, that was from my Indonesia cruise last year. Uh, oops. Sorry. I, I haven't gotten the hang of this side sink thing. So that's my son, he's very cute. Um, all right, so there, if I don't do that, then I can't see what, what is going on here. So, okay, uh, so here's ArcGIS Earth on mobile phone, on an Android phone. It's not a web browser, this is a native app. Uh, all right, here we go. Um, so yeah, it's not a it's not a web browser, not a native native. Or it is a native app. Um, we are planning to have uh, to have iOS and Android when this comes out. Um, I can do things like you know I had it open before, and you, you can see I've got the I've got our world elevation service, and um, I can zoom in and out. I I actually we are we have uh, started to have things like. Uh, 
I do think I guess I might need to go closer. Uh, reduce my height more. Okay. Still more. I don't realize how. Oh, that's an interesting thing. Usability. So there, I've got a, I've got the ability to have some interactive tools on this app. Uh, I can access content in my portal if I want. So these are a bunch of different, actually, web scenes and scene layers that I can access from this now. And that's actually something else that's in Earth uh, Desktop, is the ability to access scenes and web scenes and web maps. Um, I, so I'm accessing this stuff from ArcGIS Online. But we're also rolling out, as I said earlier, that mobile scene packaging functionality, where um, we, we will be adding the ability to actually allow you to package a whole bunch of content to deploy to a device for disadvantaged scenarios. So all right, I thank you guys for staying over. Um, how about one last question, if anybody has one? Yes, sir. Uh, the animation, so th you can actually generate a movie file and do whatever you want with it. Um, you, we don't have the ability to push those to online yet, um, but it's, it's been in my hopes for a while that we'll actually add that so that the animation actually goes into your web scene. And that's the goal. Uh, we haven't done it yet, so it's just been a bandwidth and priorities thing. Any other questions while, while we're, we're here? No? Well, thank you all for staying so long. I hope you liked what you saw, and uh, we're really eager for feedback, so please feel free to get in touch with us. Thank you. Hey, Robin. How are you? Nice to see you. For sure.